Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual gathering space. My name is Tamara Williams and I am the executive director of the Wong Center for Global Education, which together with PLU's nationally ranked Peace Corps prep program is privileged to sponsor and coordinate today's two-part celebration of service, during which PLU and our extended community collectively honor the memory of US ambassador to Libya, Christopher Chris Stevens, who was killed serving his country on September 11, 2012 in Benghazi, Libya. In honoring Ambassador Stevens today, we breathe life into PLU's mission of educating students for lives of thoughtful inquiry, service, leadership, and care for other people, for their communities, and for the earth. First, through a panel presentation of three amazing PLU alumni who, like the ambassador, served in the United States Peace Corps. Then later this evening at 7 p.m. through a keynote presentation by an expert and activist in global health of women and LGBTIQ plus communities worldwide, Amy Bishop, who served with the late ambassador in the Peace Corps in Morocco and embraces him as a friend. First, a few remarks, anecdotes really, that shed light on the extraordinary career public servant whose life we celebrate today. Recognize the importance of language study in fostering communication across differences. Chris Stevens studied French and Arabic and Spanish, which he learned in, in high school and improved in AFS, um, in an AFS high school in a program in Bilbao, Spain and later learning Italian, which he studied at UC Berkeley and honed at a study abroad program in Perugia. He began his career as a public servant as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. David Burgess, who served as the Peace Corps country director in Morocco during Stevens' time there said of his service. As a Peace Corps volunteer, Chris Stevens was creative and determined. He would complete any task. He made others look good. He shared credit and he accepted responsibility. He wasn't afraid to make mistakes or to apologize and ask for forgiveness when he did. We can all learn lessons from a life so well lived. Indeed, it was the way the ambassador Stevens conducted diplomacy, in particular, his willingness to take risks and build bridges across differences to mitigate conflict that a recent article described as cutting edge. And I quote, he understood the centrality of human relationships in America's national security systems. His, uh, his, his death revealed longstanding shortcomings in adapting US engagement abroad to the more dy dynamic and dangerous environments in which civilian foreign policy practitioners must now live and operate. Underscoring the ambassador's human and relational approach to the very hard work of diplomacy, the same article cites a tribute written by the ambassador's father in June of 2013. And I quote, he died doing what he loved most, working to build bridges of understanding and mutual respect between the people of the United States and the people of the Middle East. He was successful because he embodied the traits that have always endeared America to the world, a commitment to democratic principles, a respect for others, regardless of race, religion, and culture. He amazed and impressed people by walking the streets with the lightest of escorts, sitting in sidewalk cafes, chatting with passersby. There was a risk to being accessible, his father, Jan Stevens, wrote about his son. Chris knew it and he accepted it. The purpose of this lecture in the spirit of the family of Ambassador Stevens' wishes is to continue the work that Ambassador Stevens began, which is to prepare students to serve in this way to build bridges through increased understanding and in-depth knowledge of the complexity of the world, a commitment to mutual respect and care for others and their communities in the interest of fostering world peace. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge briefly all those that have given their time, skills, direction, ongoing support and resources to make this virtual event possible. I'm especially grateful to the event planning team which included Rosemary Reynolds and the Wong Center with whom this event would simply not be what it is. PLU's Department of Marketing and Communications, Simon for the poignant event image, 
Zach and Salong for their ongoing guidance and support, but especially for the extraordinary slideshow that we shared as you joined us today, featuring PLU alumni that have served or continue to serve worldwide. To Mary Duval and PLU's Division of Advancement for her support in helping us reach PLU alumni and the larger community. To John Strusenberg, who is supporting us on this webinar today. To Sarah Calvin Stugville, the student assistant in the Wong Center. And last and not least, my gratitude to Dr. Rose McKenney, Professor of Geosciences and Environmental Studies at PLU and Acting Director of PLU's nationally ranked Peace Corps prep program, who with no further delay will now proceed with introducing the panel. Welcome everybody and thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, as Tamara said, I am the current Acting Director of the Peace Corps prep uh, program and I wanted to um, let you know a little bit about what the prep program entails before I introduce our student moderator um, for the panel. Our Peace Corps prep program, which is fourth in the nation, um, is a program which prepares students to serve in the Peace Corps or in fact, any service, particularly any service abroad. It has six sectors, education, the environment, health, community economic development, youth development, and agriculture that students choose. They take courses and hands-on work in one of those six areas of their choice. They also take a set of courses in intercultural uh, competency and have leadership and development along with language skills. I wish I had had the opportunity to take um, a course, a set of courses like this to prepare me for my own Peace Corps service years ago. Um, and I'm so happy that our wonderful panelists will be moderated and introduced by Mar Marissa Alger, a student at PLU today. She's a junior. She was born and raised in Bremerton um, and she majors in economics, French, and global studies with an international relations focus. But most important to me, um, she's a minor in the Peace Corps prep program with a community economic development um, focus. She will be moderating the panel. I will be returning for the question and answer uh, session later at the end of the, uh, the formal panel. Um, and as we're going along, please feel free to type in questions that you have for the panelists in the Q&A box. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Marissa, who will introduce our panelists and moderate the panel. Thank you so much, Rose, for the introduction. I'm so excited to be able to introduce you all to our amazing panelists. First, we have Margaret Chell, who graduated from PLU in 2018 with a degree in Global Studies. After graduating, she joined the Peace Corps as a public health education volunteer in Guinea. Now she works on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota as an AmeriCorps volunteer, building the capacity of health systems on the reservation, and she'll also be starting med school this year. Next, we have Colin Hartke, who graduated from PLU in 2008 with degrees in communication and Spanish. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mozambique, focusing on preventative health actions for HIV and malaria. He received his master's in public health from the University of Washington, and he currently works for Accolade, an environmental health advocacy organization. Finally, we have Annie Lin, who graduated from PLU in 2008 as well, with majors in French, Spanish, and Global Studies. She participated in the Peace Corps Master International Program as a preventative health education volunteer in rural Senegal surrounding cervical cancer prevention and mercury exposure reduction programs in gold mining communities. She led a pilot study surrounding community case management for malaria that was then scaled up throughout Senegal. Now she works as a malaria technical advisor for the US Agency for International Development, supporting the work of the US President's Malaria Initiative. So our first question today is what expectations did you have about Peace Corps service prior to starting assignment and how did your expectations change during your service? I'd like to start with Margaret, please. Thanks so much and thanks for the introduction. And to be completely honest, my expectations for the Peace Corps were actually um, set back at PLU in a global development course. 
uh, Annie here, one of our panelists, came to speak to my class with Dr. Shaw and spoke about her work in Senegal. And that really planted the seed about Peace Corps and just uh, public health work. And I decided that it was something that I wanted to look more closely into. I will say that her expectations, I think she had a really incredible service. Uh, it was really awesome to learn about her work. I think that um, Annie was absolutely a super volunteer and perhaps an anomaly in the Peace Corps. Um, I really expected to get to Guinea and have other volunteers work to kind of follow up on, have projects that would be established in my community. However, I found that really wasn't the case. Um, I was the first volunteer in my community in a very rural site in Guinea. Also, um, upon Googling Guinea, the first things that come up are oftentimes the Ebola outbreak because it was the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak. So during that outbreak, Peace Corps volunteers worldwide were actually evacuated. So Peace Corps, the Peace Corps program in Guinea was really rebuilding. Um, this is a comp that I, comment that I really wanna make just because during the coronavirus, volunteers worldwide were also evacuated. And so just keep in mind that Peace Corps programs everywhere in the world now are going to have to essentially start from scratch in a lot of ways. And so being a part of a program that was just reopening after the Ebola epidemic meant that really anything and everything was on the table. Um, I expected going into it that I would learn French because that's the national language of Guinea. And so I met with some professors in the French department at PLU. I started a little bit of self-studying. And then during our pre-service training, we were actually the first cohort to exclusively get local language. So I kind of balanced my French um, language because it was the national language with Pular, which is the language of my community. And then about halfway through the pre-service training, they sent us all off to our communities and said, you're gonna stay there for a week without really any introduction, any idea of what we'd be doing, but really just to get to know and get a sense for where we'd be for the next two years. So I got to my community and shortly realized that the only person that really spoke French would be the doctor at my health post. So I totally threw my uh, French study out the window because I decided if I wanted to communicate with the groups that I'd be working with, which were primarily women and children, I'd have to learn Pular. And so that was a very rewarding task to undertake because you know, after learning Pular, I was able to speak with anyone in the community. While there were a few that spoke French, they also always spoke Pular. So I also thought that my work would revolve around the health post. Um, I shortly came to realize that people that are accessing the health post already are probably gonna have better health outcomes. Um, the mission of the Peace Corps in Guinea Public Health was definitely maternal and child health outcomes. And those mothers and children that were going to the health post were actually probably more like positive deviants. They were people in the community that were doing something different and it was going well. So I realized that um, the expectations for my service in terms of language learning, but also in terms of where I'd be working really had to come from where I was working in my community. I'd also like to highlight that I worked in rural Futa, Guinea. Um, so my community was very different from other volunteers throughout the country. There are four languages, four major ethnic groups spoken throughout the country. And so what my service looked like was very different from what anyone else's service in the country looked like. So I don't want you know those expectations for local language versus French to really be extrapolated to the entire country because Peace Corps services are very unique and individual. Thank you so much for sharing. Colin, would you like to talk about your expectations prior to leaving and how they changed during your service? Sure, that sounds great. And I think that there's a couple things that, that Margaret said that really ring true for me. So um, when I was preparing to, to go into the Peace Corps and, and I served in Northern Mozambique, um, I thought that I would go in and there would be a relatively well-defined role for me. I you know, came from large organizations in the United States where I had a, a specific job description but I had never done um, work alongside a community and I wasn't really expecting the reality that that work can be very nuanced. It can change based on um, kind of different decision-making structures, but really the, the ability to be flexible and work around those nuances can lead to a richer experience. And having done more work alongside communities in the US after returning from the Peace Corps, I found that to be very true in, in work here as well. Um, a second thing that was interesting, I hadn't had um, training in public health prior to, to going into the Peace Corps. And so when I thought about health and I thought about the work that I would do, I, I considered health as linked only to clinical care. Um, I'd worked for healthcare delivery organizations in the United States. And you know, I really 
envisioned health as being directly linked to clinical care only. And, you know, in my Peace Corps service, had the opportunity, similar to Margaret, to, to work with the local health post, but also had the opportunity to better understand the ways that many aspects of our life are linked to, to health from foods we eat and, you know, our occupations and environmental exposures and, um, you know, structures and, and racism and so many different things that can dramatically um, impact health and health outcomes. And I think that, you know, working alongside a community in Mozambique really opened my eyes to looking at health um, much more broadly. And then I think on a really personal level related to uh, to Peace Corps service, I thought that it would be a relatively, a relatively solitary experience and that I would, you know, potentially be lonely. And, and that expectation was, was kind of shattered. And, you know, my experience was that, you know, I was often surrounded by, you know, people who wanted to include me and, you know, I, I didn't have a ton of alone time and instead I had you know, much more of a kind of community experience during the Peace Corps. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Annie, would you be able to share how your current work relates to your Peace Corps service? Sure, thanks. Um, so as, as Marissa mentioned um, in the introductions, I am a malaria technical advisor for the US President's Malaria Initiative at, at USAID. And I um, lead the community health worker team. And so I can honestly say that in a professional as well as personal way, I think about my Peace Corps service every single day. I mean, you know, in global conversations about how we should, the policies around how the US government, you know, should pay for community health worker programs and what I have in my mind all the time are the community health workers that I worked with and the health system that they fit fed into the face of the health center where I worked. And so I just have that grounding experience in those spaces and their realities that really are, are with me all the time. Um, and I think, you know, obviously I don't know, I, you know, my Peace Corps experience was in a very um, specific part of Senegal. I think I was right across, based on Margaret's comments, right across the border from where she was in, in Guinea. So I also felt like it was very different from anywhere else in Senegal. So, um, we were kind of in a similar area, just different countries. Um, but so I know that very, very specific context, but I think what Peace Corps does in, in really diving you into a context is teaches you the questions to ask. So when, you know, when generalities are thrown around about how we should or shouldn't do something in development or global health, I think just so really, I feel like because of my Peace Corps experience, I can really probe and try to get at like, what does that actually look like on the ground? How would this program actually reach communities? Um, and I think that Peace Corps can, that, that, that experience, that really living that, not just visiting, but really living that um, it sets, you, sets you up to work in, in global health and development in a way that I couldn't imagine um, doing otherwise. Thank you. So high quality service focuses on the recipro reciprocal relationship between those serving and the community that they're working in. Margaret, would you be able to share how the relationships with your community affected how you served and what work you chose to do? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are kind of two components to this question. First of all, the relationships and also reciprocity. Um, I think Colin really nailed this one on the head when he talked about, you know, envisioning everything relates back to health. So I got to my community and especially once my Pular skills, you know, developed and I was comfortable having conversations with folks in my community, I was able to really understand what they would be interested in. Um, that couldn't have happened without language, but that also couldn't have happened without significant time spent there. You know, as the first white person to really come and live in that community, I had a kind of, I had to earn my trust um, with people. And so that was done just by cooking with women, working with farmers in their fields, coloring with kids on my front porch. I mean, I absolutely enjoyed that component of my service. And I think that was a huge part of it. Once I really became comfortable with the language and was able to talk to people about what they would be interested in, I started to realize that everything was related back to health. This is something that Colin brought up, but I think that the social determinants of health are something that are incredibly important and something that I really had to think back on. So social de determinants of health are just anything that can really impact one's health outcomes and they include education and uh, income and also your neighborhood and your environment. So really when farmers came to me and they said, you know, we wanna, we wanna add some more income generating crops to our fields, like coffee plants. You know, initially I was like, well, that's not really health. And I thought, uh, that's ridiculous. You know, if they plant coffee and they make more money with, from the, those coffee plants and coffee trees, then they're going to be able to access the health system more appropriately. 
So when people asked me if I would help teach English at the school, I first initially thought, you know, that's not my priority as a public health education volunteer. We know when people are more educated, they have better health outcomes. So really, I just had to flip um, those ideas on the head saying like, if I'm not in the health post, then I'm not doing health work. That's not true. I think um, part of integrating into the community meant that really just taking on what people found important, because I think people really do know what's best for their communities. Um, I also just want to talk a little bit about reciprocity. And I think this is something that is important to really push Peace Corps on. Um, so one of my friends from Guinea, uh, works and has started an account called Decolonizing Peace Corps. Um, it's an Instagram account and they put a lot of content out that I think is really important and I would really encourage folks on this panel to look into it. But when we think about reciprocity, unfortunately, all of the Peace Corps programs are sending Americans into other countries. However, they're not similar opportunities for people from those countries to come to the United States and earn training and do projects in um, resource denied, denied communities here in the United States. So I think um, that's one thing that I've struggled with since my Peace Corps service is really identifying how we can make these relationships more reciprocal because I know that I you know, gained so much from my Peace Corps service just in terms of how I look at the world and how I'll engage with public health in my future career. But I wanna make sure that those opportunities are also accessible to folks from other countries too. Thank you so much for sharing. Colin, would you be able to talk about how the relationships with the community you served in like affected your work? Sure, yeah, and I really appreciated Margaret's comments. And, and in, in my experience, um, you know, working in Northern Mozambique, um, one thing that I really learned was to, to invest a little more deeply in terms of my personal energy and time in relationships and to be much more open to, to others investing more, more deeply in me. I feel like, you know, I kind of came in almost with a little bit of um, armor on me and, um, you know, in the US, when I would be put on a project team, kind of the expectation was, you know, get down to work and, you know, maybe there's a team builder might be awkward, might be fun, but, you know, that's it in terms of getting to know somebody on a, on a personal level. And then, you know, let's start um, really doing the quote professional work. And what I found in my experience um, working with um, folks doing really amazing things in the community was that they wanted to invest time to get to know me and they wanted to invest their personal energy. And when I opened myself up to that amazing gift and then started to return that and take the time, you know, on late afternoons after work to just, you know, walk by somebody's house, sit for, you know, an hour and shoot the breeze and just be with somebody who, who cares about me because I'm a human and I care about them because they're human, that that was really um, an important part of building relationships and that took a long time. And then the, the second part, and it, it's funny because it's really similar to something that, um, that Margaret had said, was um, stopping going in with as many expectations and going in instead looking to, to listen and learn. Um, and one of the examples that Margaret shared is something that also struck me. Um, you know, I worked a lot with um, uh, kind of late teen peer educators who were doing really great community work, but they were also really interested in learning English. And so, you know, we formed awesome English clubs and, you know, it was a skill that they wanted to build up and you know, were able to use a curriculum that talked about health as part of English um, education. And it could kind of, you know, serve that role of both, you know, making sure that you're understanding what somebody really wants and needs, and then, you know, matching that with, you know, available resources. And so I think that those aspects of, you know, investing time and energy, and then also really making sure that you're coming and listening first were really helpful in terms of building relationships and, and the people when I did that, that I, you know, built those relationships, really listened to them. Those were the people who I ended up, you know, working with the most closely and, and really having um, the most success with in terms of collaboration. Perfect, thank you so much. So our next question is, how did your perception of community health needs align with the community's perception of their own health needs? And then what surprised you about this alignment or lack thereof? And how did you deal with conflicts that arose due to any lack of alignment? Annie, would you be able to start, please? Sure, so I think a couple of examples of this come to mind. Um, and you know, as, as was referenced by the other speakers in the previous um, question, you know, the integrating in a community and understanding what their needs is a really important part of the Peace Corps philosophy. And um, I think that that's, that was really Im important for me. You know, we were instructed like for the first three months, like don't do any work, just be in, be in the community. And so that really gives you 
you know, the, the chance to understand what their needs are. Um, for me personally, I felt like I had a kind of a double integration that I needed to do. One was with the, the Malinke community that I that I lived in, but another was with the staff at the health center who were more educated people who had been basically like sent from Dakar, um, from the capital to um, Tusaria, the village where I lived in order to um, be the nurses and doctors there. And so they were also, you know, integrating into this community it was a totally different culture, language barriers, et cetera. And so the health programs that they were doing were often, it's a really centralized health system. So this was all coming from the top, from the national level, you know, coming to them and, and they were, you know, following the directives. And then the community had often their own ideas about what was important and what wasn't. Um, and so for me, it was really important to take the time to kind of see both of those angles from my counterparts at the health center, but also um, my host family and other people in the community, as well as the villages that surrounded. Um, and I think the first thing that really came up was the, my first rainy season, um, seeing, um, seeing malaria all of a sudden arrive and seeing my host family not really do much about it when, when a kid would, would be, be sick. And it was pretty clear that that was what was going on. And to me, you know, coming in, I was like, well, why, you know, why, why are you going to the health center is like a five minute walk away, you know, the, you know, you have access to care, what is, you know, what's going on and really like, you know, talk, talking over and over again and trying to get people to take their kids in quickly, explaining that, you know, the, the US provides these anti-malarial drugs and they're free. Um, and, um, and just still seeing kids their, their caretakers wait. Um, and I'm really glad that Margaret brought up the social determinants of health because I think it's, you know, sometimes we talk about just health communication and what people need to know. And, you know, you can talk someone's ear off about, you know, why they should make a specific choice, but there's so much more to, that impacts their behavior. And what we really saw was that, yes, while the anti-malarial meds were free, you've got this, when they go into the health center, there is a, gonna be a language barrier between the, the nurse who's providing care and, and the patient um, as, because we, spoke, we, you know, we were in this place where um, Senegal, most of Senegal didn't even know that Malinke was a language that existed in, in their country. Um, so, you know, really, it's, a, you know, really quite remote. They're, and so, but the, also the thing is, is that when a kid would come in with, um, with malaria or some other drug, they, or um, some other illness, the nurse would do, do a good job of saying, okay, well, this is also an opportunity to deworm this child and to, you know, to give them vitamins and all these other things. Um, that they would then sell, make most of the money to keep the health center running. So, and but without the communication about what was happening, you would go away and you wouldn't think that the anti-malarials were free. You just have this laundry list of prescriptions that you're supposed to give this kid, and you don't really understand it. And so, um, that was what, it. Took you know quite a while of being there through a, through a rainy season, sitting in on some some appointments, and understanding that where this disconnect was happening. Um, and then a, a friend of mine who was a year. Um, ahead of me in his service had had a similar experience um, in his village and his, his host sister had, had died from malaria. And so he spent, spent a lot of time thinking about this, you know, she, she died and she lived in the same family compound as the community health worker and yet didn't seek care. Um, and so this was, this was such an issue. Um, and so he and the community health worker devised this program where um, community health workers would actually be paid to go on a, like a sweep of the village once a week during the rainy season and just find anyone who had symptoms of malaria and test them there. And they would take the onus off of the caregiver to go seek care. And they're gonna provide the care free of charge and actually show that it, this, it, this, these medications are free. Um, and so they, they piloted this and I was a year later in my service, I was happened to be located at the health center that oversaw all of these villages. And so we did a pilot study um, to look at this and we found that just this this small shift. I mean, these community health workers were already trained. They were already out there. Um, they had the meds, but this shift of them once a week going out um, to the into the community to find people who who were sick, that actually increased the care seeking because they were able to show that the, the drugs were free, that they were competent, even though they were just a, they were just a community health worker, you know, with the same background as the people in the village. Um, and it had a huge effect on, on care seeking behavior and on malaria transmission as well. And so now it's, it's, being, it's been scaled up to the entire country. And so it just really, I think, um, highlights that there often is a disconnect um, between what people's perceived needs are and the way that health systems are trying to address them. And, it, and we, we can innovate, we can think past, you know, telling people what they should do, but try to think of how a system can meet them where they are to try to achieve some better alignment. Thanks.
Thank you. Margaret, would you be able to share any differences that, between your own perception of community health needs and the community's own perception? Yeah, absolutely. So during pre-service training, Peace Corps volunteers spend between two to three months, like depending on the Peace Corps country, kind of learning about different public health for public health education volunteers like myself, you know, interventions in their host countries. And so I like to, I'll just share this story about my pre-service training, because I think it really highlights kind of maybe priorities that we can have going into it, but how they might not be um, realistic. So during my pre-service training, we were in the city of Dubraco, which is outside of the capital of Guinea. And uh, get Peace Corps Guinea, one of the priorities was, you know, hygiene, so hand washing. So they brought all of us public health education volunteers to a local elementary school. We spent the whole afternoon there playing games with kids. And then also we did an exercise teaching them how to wash their hands. So there were all sorts of fun demonstrations that we did, including passing an orange around that was covered in butter and then showing, having them wash their hands. And if you do it with just water, you notice the butter doesn't go away. But if you do it with soap, you can see your hands are clean. So that butter kind of symbolizes germs. So we did this, the kids were super engaged. They had a lot of fun. Um, it was really fun for all of us because it was our first time kind of interacting with the community and doing a public health intervention and get ideas for how we could work in our own communities. So after we finished this um, demonstration, we met with the principal of the school and he said, you know, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciated it. Um, however, we don't have any water. How do you expect these kids to wash their hands? You know, they didn't have a well at the school. They were walking maybe half a kilometer or so to bring water in. And so, you know, a project like that, you just rec I just recognized, I think, right away in my pre-service training that there are going to be a lot of barriers um, to implementing projects. And so it's really important to always, you know, they're not always going to be anticipated, right? Like I, I think Peace Corps probably knew that this school didn't have a well, but you know, if the hand washing is still important. So we went in there anyways. Um, I could give you multiple accounts of projects that didn't go so well in my community, but there are also successful ones as well. So I think um, during that pre-service training, I really kind of had to step back and say, wow, like this, you know, it's, it's going to be tough because I'm going to fall on my face so many times um, trying to implement projects, but I think it really brought me with that expectation going into my community to say, you know, what are the things that you want in your community because people ultimately they know what's best for them and they have priorities and so to really identify where their priorities align with my abilities, I think was the most important factor for determining what would be feasible and sustainable in a two year Peace Corps service. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, our next question is, given what you learned during your service, what are your thoughts about healthcare and messaging about care related to the current pandemic? Colin, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. There was um, one thing that really stuck out to me during my Peace Corps service related to um, health communication, and it was the, the power of stories. And, you know, I worked in a community that had a, a high prevalence of, of HIV, um, and there was still a lot of stigma around folks living with HIV and um, people were sometimes scared to go get care. Um, but there were some really amazing community leaders and, and um, community health workers who, you know, on different occasions would share their own personal stories about how um, HIV had, you know, impacted their lives or the lives of those people that they loved. And they would make, um, you know, something that was you know, so hard to grasp, you know, this concept of a disease that could be difficult to even, you know, really get your arms around it. And they made it so, so real and so, so personal. And, and I think that that really resonates today with, with COVID. I think that, you know, we're watching a tragedy unfold and it's, it's hard, it's hard to understand the, the scale of it. Um, and, you know, we can see the statistics and, you know, we have a, a shared sense of grief. But when we when we dive in and we see real stories about you know people who have lost their lives to COVID or who have you know been sick um, for for long periods of time and had inc incredible suffering, I think that it really brings us much closer to something and you know motivates us to take those actions to protect ourselves and to protect you know the people that that we love. Um, and so I think that that idea of sharing stories is something that you know, so resonates with me kind of across all contexts and, and related to health, but almost every important topic. 
Thank you so much for sharing. And then our final question is, in the US, we tend to think about healthcare on an individual level. What did your time in the Peace Corps working with communities teach you about how the health of communities relates to an individual's health? And I'd like to open it up for anyone that would like to speak. I guess I can offer a few comments. Um, I think that serving communities is going to be more sustainable. I think every cultural context is going to be different. And where I found myself in Guinea, it was definitely a community centered culture. Um, a few, you know, malaria was really devastating to the country of Guinea. Um, it's responsible for 15% of deaths. However, there are statistics that show that if 70% of people in a community sleep under a mosquito net, then malaria will be eradicated in that community. So you can see that if individuals at the community level all use a mosquito net, then everyone will benefit. Um, on top of that, the entire community that I lived in um, all benefited from one water source. So some people in the community would walk maybe half a mile. That was a little bit closer. However, when that one water source would dry up at the end of the dry season, kind of reliably every year, then we'd all have to walk about a half mile to get water. So just understanding that so many, um, so many things and so many pieces that are so related to public health, whether it be mosquito nets or water sources, are all need to be implemented or accessible to the entire community, I think was really crucial to understanding how I could best serve the community. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have anything to share for that one? I can jump in. I, I think Margaret summed it up really well. Um, I think from the, the perspective of the project that I was that I was referring to, I think, you know, what we saw, what you see with like early care seeking for malaria, and this can be um, you know, translated to the COVID context too, you know, as if someone gets, gets treated and um, gets their own <laughs> disease under control, it's, a, it's an individual level decision because you're not going to have that disease progress, you know, hopefully to, to, to severe disease, but then you're also limiting, you know, if a mosquito, a mosquito can't, can't transmit the malaria parasite if it doesn't have a host, a human host to, to, to extract it from. And so um, that's what, that's why we essentially saw this, this intervention that was designed to prevent, uh, you know, children from, from developing severe malaria actually also had an effect on transmission. And so thinking about the, you know, um, we try to do a lot of our messaging around that, you know, the importance of of early care seeking, not only for you as an individual, but for the, for the community. Um, and I think that that really, um, it started to show itself and how and how and how that worked because you know and that's why community health workers um, are are so effective at what they do is that they're a part of the community and they understand the um, you know the needs um, and 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 are and are well positioned to meet them. Thank you so much. So I'd like to pass it back to Rose. Um, everyone that's watching can leave any questions that they have in the Q and A section. Um, and we'll allow the panelists to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa, for the wonderful job of moderating that panel. Um, so I have a question from the audience. I've got a couple of questions. Um, Alexis asked, how is learning about um, the health in, in these different communities changed your point of view on health in the United States? I, I think, I'll jump in with a, a few thoughts there. I think it, um, to me, just pointed at, you know, the, the core parts of, you know, health are often shared. They're, they're influenced by the context. But, you know, I think many of the same challenges that, that folks were trying to overcome in Mozambique, you know, many people in the United States are, are trying to overcome and, you know, doing the same um, in the same process of, you know, prioritizing and struggling with, you know, different needs of, you know, how do I make sure that I, you know, get my sleep when I need to, you know, work really hard to, to pay bills, um, you know, could be very similar to, you know, what somebody who, you know, I was working alongside in, in Mozambique, who, you know, many of the people were farmers, you know, it was really important to take care of your farm. How do you kind of prioritize those other things that you know are important, whether or not that's going to the health post or um, making sure you mend a, you know, a mosquito net that has, you know, gotten a hole in it, et cetera. So I think it's, I think for me, it just pointed out, you know, kind of how similar context, very different and very important, but, you know, we're all, we're all sharing in, in some of these, these same challenges. Yeah, I'd also like to comment that I think it's allowed me to look more closely at, you know, health in the United States. And there are absolutely communities in the United States that parallel, you know, some of the worst health outcomes in the world. 
um, whether it be urban or rural. Right now I work on the Rosebud Nation and between Pine Ridge Reservation and South Dakota and Rosebud Reservation, also in South Dakota, they have the lowest life expectancy in the United States. And if you look at, you know, morbidity rates, they actually really parallel Guinea and Sub-Saharan Africa, which are oftentimes referenced as some of the worst health outcomes in the world. So I think it's also important to highlight that there's work to be done everywhere in the world, um, including in the United States. And to really, you know, I think um, Professor Shaw always talked about how, you know, people will oftentimes be critical and say, you know, why do you have to do your work overseas? You know, there's stuff to be done in the United States, but it's not an either or there, you know, just pick what makes sense to you, what's realistic for you, what you're passionate about, and there's work that needs to be done everywhere. Thank you so much for that, Colin, and thank you both for sharing. Um, another another uh, attendee has asked, can you talk about what programs that didn't work well and uh, as you would have liked, and you touched on those, but how did you handle that? I can jump in, I mean, there's, <laughs> So, so many things come to mind. I think, I, you know, one thing that I, I read an article with the, with the headline, Peace Corps taught me how to fail. And I think that that is <laughs> so true. I mean, I think you have to be able to, um, you know, take yourself lightly and realize that, that you know, things are, aren't going to work and that, you know, development work is hard and building relationships in a totally different culture where, you know, um, it's, it's, it's hard work. Um, you know, they call it the toughest job you'll ever love. And I think that that's so true. Um, you know, I'm trying to even think. Of, so I, I remember one day just, so we had the very specific context of my Peace Corps site was that there was a gold rush happening around it. Um, and so like everything that you would expect from like the wild west, we're, you know, seeing, we were seeing in, in these gold mining sites. And so there was, um, you know, people just coming in, they, you know, this, the, the biggest gold mining site um, near my village, when we first got there, had 250,000 or 250 people. And when, when we left, they were estimating like 20 to 30,000, they just didn't know. And so this, this place had just one water pump for all of these people, you know, and, and, and so all of the public health needs were exacerbated. Um, and the, one of the, one of the huge issues was was sex trafficking um, coming in, and so I got a I had a grant um, from from Peace Corps to um, to do HIV prevention work with the with the sex workers that were that were there, and so um, I had this this idea of you know we'll go and we'll I'm gonna go out with the mid, with the Senegalese midwife and we're gonna go and do this like talk about uh, STDs and we're gonna get this condom distribution network going through the bars where, where these women are living and it seemed like just this great idea of like meeting people where they were at and we go out there and I just realized right away that I was so out of out of my element and um, it, it was a it was a rowdy place and all of a sudden like my offer to like buy soda for the um, for this like health talk that we were gonna have, all of a sudden people were like throwing bottles of wine everywhere, and people and, and it was just it was just terrible. And I was so so out of out of my depth. And the midwife that I had taken with me was just really shy, and so she didn't say anything. And so after that, we adapted, and all the all the sex workers um, sex work is legal in Senegal, but you have to have these monthly health checks. And so they were coming into the health center anyway. So we used the captive audience <laughs> to do like these health talks there. Um, it was much more, it was definitely the more appropriate setting, um, you know, it, and we were able to do, you know, kind of distribution that way. Um, but it was a huge lesson learned of, of what I could, what I could handle. <laughs> yeah, I can chime in. Um, one project I was working with um, community associations that was they were made up of community health workers who were people um, living with HIV, and then they were serving others in the community who were living with HIV and then providing important prevention work. Um, and one of the one key thing was related to nutrition and kind of the staple food was called shima, which is like a corn porridge. Um, and there's ways to, to enrich it by adding other elements to it, but it required milling um, those other elements, which can be quite expensive. And the, um, the association had through, and I'm, I, I can't remember exactly, but somehow through an NGO had gotten a mill donated. And, you know, they had gone through a really long process of finding, you know, a site and the, where they were going to have this mill and it was going to allow them to you know, enrich the Shima. But at the end of the day, the, the electric grid would not support a mill. So, you know, the association ended up with 
you know, a, an expensive piece of equipment that had been donated and that, that wasn't, going, wasn't going to work. And, you know, like I was working alongside this association and, you know, I think it took a lot of just, you know, accepting setbacks, but being incredibly kind of persistent and thinking through, you know, option B, option C, option D. And, you know, the mill, <laughs> it works today. It did not work the whole time I was there um, and for many, many years afterwards, but it, it does have electricity, you know, to it today. And, and that's great. And, um, and that's through the, the hard continued work of the association. But, you know, definitely, I think I had, you know, moments where it was like, you know, face in palm about, you know, just the, all the lessons learned. You know, the question I had for the four of you, and this is really thinking also about potential current students in the audience, is that all three of you came to public health in a sort of indirect way, right? Um, most of you were either global studies majors, uh, Annie did languages, so Colin did communications and languages. And I'm just, I would like to hear you think a little bit out loud about um, that trajectory and what you think you gained in taking this more circumcutous road to health, since all of you are now working in health. Um, and what do you think students might want to think about in terms of taking a direct kind of undergraduate health sciences path to nursing and medicine versus the route that you took? Because I think that might be helpful for some of our current students to think about. I just found it, uh, for me personally, really important not to go straight through undergrad because I think I'd always kind of thought that I would want to go to medical school, but I wasn't certain. But the reality is the patients I'll be working with and the communities I'll be working with and the populations at large don't have health backgrounds. So for me to be able to kind of understand cultural contexts, social context, um, structural context, um, before, you know, working as a physician, I think was really important. I think this experience absolutely really drove my interest in pursuing medical school. I think health justice is really going to be at the center of my career. And I think without Peace Corps, I wouldn't have been able to like articulate that and understand how that would look. Thank you, Margaret. Do either Annie or Colin? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, if I think about the first time that I was really, really worked on health, like Tamara, you played no small part in that. And I, I, I studied in, in Oaxaca and um, Tamara helped um, you know, figure out what internships we were going to be doing and connected me with the, um, the, the Hunger Project, the organization that I ended up doing an internship with, which was really my first experience working in health. Um, and following um, very, that and other study away experiences, you know, I knew that I wanted to do Peace Corps, that I wanted to do some kind of, you know, service. And I remember specifically looking at um, the Peace Corps brochure and like seeing all the different sectors and just really feeling like for me, what really stood out as um, being the issue that I really wanted to, to learn more about and to, to spend my service addressing was health. Um, and, and it just felt like really the most basic human right um, and that, that I just really felt, felt compelled to like want to dive in on that. Um, and having had that experience in Oaxaca, I definitely um, supported that. Um, and then when I went, to, I ended up doing grad school before Peace Corps um, and did, did public health. And my, my cohort was so interdisciplinary um, and, I, and I really loved that. Like some people did come from the, the basic sciences, but a lot of people came from different, different liberal arts or, or other, other perspectives. And it really just brought really rich um, mix of people and, and perspectives into, into the game. And I think as all the examples have alluded to, um, you know, yeah, health is so interdisciplinary and it's, it's more than just, just basic science. And so I'm, you know, and especially, you know, now, you know, within, in the, in the global health field, I feel like people, the, the biggest skill that people want from me is that I speak French. <laughs> so um, I, I think that definitely having language skills um, is, is a huge, it's a huge plus for, for working in global health. Sure, and um, I can add on a little bit. So for, for me, I've always, outside of um, my Peace Corps experience, I've always worked in health communications. And so, you know, having studied communication at, at PLU was, incredibly helpful for me. And I think that Professor Joanne Lysoski is on the line. Um, she told me she was going to be today. And she was such a, a great force in my, in my Peace Corps, or pardon me, in my PLU experience. And, you know, really taught students how to get a story that is going to capture people's attention. 
And what really matters in, in health is not just capturing their attention, but then being able to give them accurate information that, that folks can take action on. And so I think that those, those skills really translated um, well. And I think, you know, health includes, you know, a bunch of careers from, you know, physicians and nurses and physical therapists, but also many non-clinicians, um, you know, working in, you know, public health or health communications. And, and so I think the meandering path kind of works well for, especially for some of those, those other areas. Thank you so much. And you all raised a, a issue near and dear to my heart, and that's interdisciplinary learning and, and what we gain from all the different disciplines. Um, the final question, I think, um, is in fact from Joanne Lasoski. Um, and she's asking, as Peace Corps alumni, um, you have a unique perspective. Um, and so can you share suggestions you have on how to make the Peace Corps more, a more effective strategy to build peace in the world? An easy question. I'll go first just because I want to first say hi to Joanne. Um, <laughs> this is one of my, my, my very favorite experiences from PLU was taking classes with uh, Joanne Lasowski, who always would ask challenging questions uh, like this one. And I, I don't think I'll do the, the response justice in, in any way. But I, one thing I really do admire about the Peace Corps is, you know, they kind of look at three different goals. And one of the goals of the Peace Corps, the third goal, is kind of doing your part to raise understanding of you know different places from around the world within the United States and to, to build that bridge. So you know having opportunities like this to, to talk with different groups and share some of your experience and um, you know kind of share some of those those stories about you know the people who you were able to interact with. I think that is just um, a really important part of Peace Corps, and I do think they do a good job at at building building that out. Um, and, you know, I think then there's a lot of really hard work to be done and, and you, Margaret, um, kind of alluded to this of how do you make sure that there's reciprocity built into Peace Corps so that you're not, you know, going in and, you know, it was this rich, wonderful experience for all of us, but how do you make sure that that is also, you know, mirrored in the communities um, where you're serving and, and, and giving opportunities to people from, from those countries as well. The third, the third goal of Peace Corps came to mind for me as well, um, and you know, and the second goal is to teach you know people about American culture too. So you know, there's that that exchange piece is built in, and I think, like when I think about my experience, all the work that I did and in, in with the health system didn't like my host family didn't really care about that. They were kind of annoyed by how much time I spent doing doing work with the health system. But like, what really mattered to them is that my family came to visit that like we could that I show that I cared enough about the village to, to bring my family. And so like, I think that that is, there's just, there's just so much, um, so much to be said for those interpersonal relationships. Um, and I think Peace Corps, from my experience of just, you know, talking to folks who work at the headquarters level, I think that over the past few years, the agency's really been at, had, had a tension within, is, are we, are we a peace and friendship agency or are we a development agency and not really knowing you know i think different countries have approached it differently and had different different a different focus i think it when i was in senegal the focus was more on the development aspect but i think that that's shifted back and so I, it'll be really interesting to see you know when volunteers go back in the field post covid evacuation what this is kind of a fresh start and it'll be really interesting to see how the agency approaches some of those questions some of the questions about reciprocity and decolonization that are so important to Yeah, and I just kind of want to yeah thank you Colin for highlighting again those channels for reciprocity identifying ways that Peace Corps can become more reciprocal I think is a really important part of strengthening its potential. On top of that, I just want to share like a comment that Dr. Wiley had with me when I was a Peace Corps prep student. Um, I went and talked to her about the Peace Corps what what I should, you know, know before going in and one thing that she said is when she went back to her host country. Um, oftentimes she would go to different communities and they would say, oh, like you're from the United States. Did you know so-and-so Peace Corps volunteer? And she kind of referenced that it was tough because, you know, 
it seemed like a lot of these volunteers hadn't maintained their relationships with their communities. So I think it's really important for anyone considering Peace Corps service to really understand that, you know, these are genuine, real relationships and to try to do your best to sustain them in any way possible, you know, whether that's a phone call through Facebook Messenger, whether or not that's traveling back to your host country. But I think that is really important to really recognize how powerful those relationships are for your host community. And also to, I think that is another part of reciprocity. Thank you all. That, um, a really good take on how we maintain peace um, and some of the things that maybe I haven't done so well in life with maintaining um, relationships with my original host community. Um, I wanted to thank all of the panelists, Annie, Margaret, and Colin for their time, Marissa for her moder um, wonderful job of moderating this panel. Um, and I also wanted to, re and, and the audience for attending, I wanted to remind the audience and, and the panelists and Marissa, if they would like to come as well, um, that this evening at seven, Amy Bishop will be um, presenting on Vulnerabilities Amplified, which is a look at the, um, the impact of identity on, um, outcomes, on health outcomes. So thank you all for your time and attention. I really appreciate um, all the work that everyone did to make this a, a good panel. Thank you.